I'm at one of the trailheads for the McIntosh Run Regional Park. Now, McIntosh Run is a river system which runs for about 13 kilometers from Bears Lake, which is up here beyond the map, all the way down to Herring Cove, which is at this corner of the map. It runs through commercial areas, through residential subdivisions, and through protected lands of all different sorts. This area was also the location of a wildfire in 2009. And now it is also the location of a single track trail network that's been community built. And it's here that I'm on my walkabout today. The trails I'll be hiking today are a network designed for shared use by hikers, mountain bikers, snowshoers, and more. The trails exist because of the hard work of the many volunteers of the McIntosh Run Watershed Association. That association was formed in 1994 to promote stewardship and the conservation of the broader McIntosh Run watershed. The trails are intended to provide an opportunity for outdoor recreation but also encourage people to get closer to nature and improve their understanding of the watershed. Well, the community association has built two different kinds of trail. They built what's called the McIntosh Run Community Trail, which runs from Central Spry Field through to Jail Ilsley High School, the Lions Rink and Roaches Pond. That's now actually managed by the municipality and connects various neighborhoods together. And in fact, connects right here to this single track network. This trail system was designed purposefully to be less impactful on the environment than a three to four meter wide crusher dust trail, which is what you find on the community trail. Single track is often used to describe mountain bike trails, and these trails are certainly well used by bikers. But single track instead refers to the width of a trail being intended for a single hiker or bike. The concept here is a little different from the more familiar parks like Shuby Park or Point Pleasant Park. Here, the single track network is intended to connect neighborhoods. The trails here are a mixture of new and adopted trails. The trails in this area are designed to something called the Whistler Trail Guidelines. And you look at this and you say, well, nobody built this trail, but they did and it's built to those guidelines. And what they're doing is they're trying to determine what route is the most ecologically appropriate for hikers and mountain bikers. Now, even the signs that you see throughout the park come from those guidelines and they indicate to everyone, but mountain bikers in particular, how difficult a route would be. Now, because these trails are not built with crusher dust or gravel, things like that. They're more natural trails. These trails represent just one of the projects of the McIntosh Run Watershed Association. That group was initially formed in 1994 to be a voice for the land and the watershed and promote conservation and public access. Building these trail networks has become part of their work but they are much, much more than just a trails organization. The association partners with schools in the area as well as universities to promote ecological stewardship. This includes programs like Fish Friends, which works with local elementary schools to raise and release trout into Macintosh Run. The local high school works in partnership with the group to do an annual river cleanup. And work with universities has fostered research and work to rehabilitate the watershed. So one of the other projects of the McIntosh Run Watershed Association is actually on your phone and it's using the iNaturalist and iNaturalist Seek apps. And it's called the Biodiversity Project. And the idea is to crowdsource information about the plants and animals that live in this watershed. And I'll give you an example. So using the Seek app, I can, which is free by the way, I can scan this plant, almost like scanning a barcode, and see it has told me this is a jack pine, which isn't surprising in this area. And if I go into the iNaturalist app, there is actually a project here called the Macintosh Run Biodiversity Project. 
And in that project, there are now 481 people who have been submitting uh, animals and plants and so forth, pictures of them. There are 6,747 observations today, and I can add my observation of a jack pine to that app. And that helps them to understand throughout the different seasons what is growing and living in this area. So I've been moving away from the residential area of Spryfield and into an area known as the Spryfield Backlands. Now, that's a bit of a no man's land between Herring Cove Road and Purcell's Cove Road. And it's a mixture of protected crown lands, protected private lands, unprotected private lands, all different sorts of land uses in there as well. And what is particularly interesting is the geology. There are two very distinct types of bedrock here. This area sits atop both Halifax Formation Slate and Devonian Granite. The slate is metamorphic rock and the granite is igneous. Neither of these types of rock allow water to penetrate, so when it rains, the water runs over the top of the rock or into fissures in the rock itself. That might seem to be just an interesting point of geology, but it has a direct impact here. The Halifax slates are known to be acidic, so when development occurs, and the slates are broken through excavation, the acid in the slate is exposed and can run off into the streams and rivers. This in turn lowers the pH of the water, which allows more metals to leach from the soils. Because the second type of rock is granite, there is no buffering ability to mitigate the impact of the acid rock, which might be the case if limestone were present rather than granite. You know, to me, this spot is just so demonstrative of the community nature of this trail. This is called Heart Rock for obvious reasons. And it's where I'm gonna take a short rest before continuing my journey as I head towards Flat Lake. That's after the break. I'm at Heart Rock on the McIntosh Run trail system in the Spryfield backlands. I'm just headed out on the Flat Lake Loop Trail, headed towards Flat Lake itself, and then back to the trailhead. I'm now headed across the Flat Lake Point Trail, which will take me down to Flat Lake itself. It is one of the larger lakes along the run, though there are ponds near the Herring Cove end, which are actually larger in surface area. Which brings up the question, what is the difference between a lake and a pond? Well, usually lakes have larger surface areas than ponds and are deeper. Though this is not always the case, which is why it may be surprising sometimes to learn a lake in an area is smaller than the surrounding ponds. As well, lakes usually have rough edges with peninsulas, while ponds tend to be more round. But again, this is also not always true. The main difference relates to light. All water in a pond is considered photic, which means the sunlight can reach the bottom, and therefore plants can always grow on the bottom of a pond. True lakes always have a photic zones which are areas where plants cannot grow because no light reaches the bottom. There are a number of official definitions for lakes and ponds, but very often the names have been established long ago by people in the area, and the word lake or pond was just what seemed appropriate with no bearing on current scientific definitions of one or the other. This is Flat Lake. Now, interestingly, there are a number of flat lakes in Nova Scotia, and there are even quite a few in the Halifax area. The naming of lakes is generally done by communities, and I guess it's a bit like that distinction between the scientific term of lake and pond, where you know communities just come up with a name that seems appropriate based on the features and may not even realize that there's another one nearby or may not even care. The point being, if a friend invites you to meet them at Flat Lake in Halifax, just be sure you know which one they mean. This one is 46 meters above sea level. 
Over time, the Watershed Association has championed and led rehabilitation and restoration projects along the McIntosh Run. Often in areas of development, streams and rivers get redirected and become faster moving as the curves are removed from the waterways and the grade increases. The change in elevation here from Bears Lake to Herring Cove is only a little more than 1%, so it is very gradual. The McIntosh Run watershed covers an area of around 37 square kilometers. Over time, the amount of water entering this watershed has increased as human development has resulted in the diversion of streams and natural drainage. Almost 20,000 people live in the watershed, and that population is growing. This looks like a pristine, almost perfect wilderness at the moment, but it's actually in a rebuilding phase. About 14 years ago, this area was subject to an extreme environmental stress. On April 29th, 2009, a small unextinguished campfire on a rise overlooking McIntosh Run, just north of Roach's Pond, turned into an out of control wildfire. It took a day for the embers of the fire to flare up, driven by strong winds. In the end, the fire could be seen across the city due to the height of the flames. The fire itself covered eight square kilometers, forced 1,100 people to evacuate, and destroyed eight homes, damaging another 10. Forest fires and urban development are a particular conundrum. Obviously, where people, homes, and businesses are at risk, wildfires need to be put out quickly. But this has the side effect of increasing the fuel load of the forest, putting those areas at even further risk. There is no easy solution to this. In some areas, prescribed burning is conducted to reduce fuel and risk, but that's not possible in urban areas. Though it's been over 14 years since the fire raced through this area, this woodland is still in a regenerative process and you can still find scorched trees among the woods. The fire here went through very, very quickly. It raced across the crowns of the forest and through the dry, woody debris on the forest floor. And that's in part because of the winds, but also because this area had not seen a significant burn for over 45 years. Two days after the fire started, on May 1st, 2009, it was declared under control. So these are jack pines, and they are distinguishable from other pine trees because they tend to have a bend or a corkscrew in the trunk. They also have a unique type of pine cone. It almost looks like someone has put lacquer over this or glue or something, unlike the crumbly ones you see on other pine trees. I've seen a lot of these throughout this hike, and there's a reason for that. These rely on forest fire to grow. That seems a bit strange, but how it works is that these pine cones will only open in extreme heat. In fact, it requires over 50 degrees Celsius in order to open. Then those seeds grow, and of course that heat is found during forest fires. And so as a result, these become some of the first trees to grow up after a wildfire. There's a variety of sizes of these trees. Some of them will just grow like shrubs, and others will grow up to 72 feet in height. If you cross the barrens in this area, it will be surprising just how many jack pines there are. Researchers have noticed that some of these have actually developed a different type of cone, which may actually be able to open in response to other stresses, not just fire. But the appearance of so many trees may also be an indication that this barren has been subject to many fires over the centuries as part of the natural ecological process. The McIntosh Run Trail System is a true community effort and an exceptional example of people working together not only to build a trail system, but also to educate about the ecology of the backlands. It also teaches us about something else, how the forest regenerates 
after a wildfire. Here, the fires are simply a memory punctuated by the loss of homes and memories. But 20 kilometers from here, a huge and historic wildfire still leaves its scars on the landscape. And that's where I'm headed after the break. May 28th, 2023 is not a day that many will soon forget in Halifax or indeed across Nova Scotia. It was a warm, sunny, beautiful day, unseasonably so for late May, when someone noticed smoke coming up from behind a home in the Upper Tantalan area. A few hours later, a wildfire was spreading through neighborhoods and the forests here. In the end, 200 properties were damaged. 151 homes were completely destroyed. There was $165 million in insured damages and much more in uninsured. And it wasn't the only wildfire that was raging across Nova Scotia. In fact, around the same time, a very large fire was burning near Barrington Lake in Shelburne County. The fire here took over a week to bring under control, and now, two months later, it's only just been declared officially out. Today, on my walkabout, I'm exploring how nature is recovered after that fire. It's easy to walk towards Spryfield and never even realize a fire had occurred there, to not remember the charred trees and forests or how the fire could so easily burn on one area of ground and leave others untouched. As I moved through this part of Tantalan from the edge of the burn zone towards where the forests were largely destroyed, those effects of fire will be obvious. But so too, less than two months after the fire, how nature is regenerating the land, an important part of the story of forest fires. I'm on a journey to understand how the forest regenerates after a wildfire. But I would be completely remiss if I did not recognize the fact that while this is an important learning opportunity and certainly an opportunity for science, there was a very real human impact here. While thankfully no human lives were lost, family pets were lost and irreplaceable memories are gone forever. The fires here also exposed weaknesses in how we develop subdivisions, understanding that we need emergency exits, and in some cases, we probably need different equipment to be able to fight these fires. It's difficult to think of a forest fire as a regenerative process, especially when there is so much loss associated with it. It's rained here a lot since the fires, and that rain is now creating new life. When you have a strong forest canopy, you end up with a lot of seeds which remain dormant in the ground. Now, exposed to the sun, the soil is warming up and those seeds are able to germinate. So one of the things that's really interesting is how nature protects itself in a forest fire. Now obviously, the fire's not gonna burn through water. And so one of the things that can happen is amphibians and reptiles might bury themselves in the mud to protect themselves. And that's why you see there's a frog right in here. And he would have probably buried himself in the mud during the fire and then come back out. Now, one of the things firefighters will tell you is they don't often see animals running away. Uh, in the middle of the fire itself. They'll see them on the outskirts. And the reason is that in most cases, animals will actually move away. Birds will fly from the fire. Uh, of course, this fire was during May, and so nesting birds may have been at risk and many may have died. It's not to say that no animals die, but the forest, the ecosystem, it has ways to protect itself and ensure that many of those animals can survive. And this frog is just one of them. Even for those animals which escape, there remains a potential impact. Nesting and foraging sites have now been destroyed, which may push some animals into closer proximity to homes. Fish in the lakes would seem safe, but burnt plants and brush will ultimately dissolve into nitrogen and phosphorus, 
If this runs off into the many lakes and rivers in the area, it could result in chemistry changes, including algae blooms far from the actual fire site. If it's bad enough, that can lead to low oxygen in the water and dead zones in lakes. There is a natural succession process to forest regeneration that's pretty much the same anywhere in the world that wildfires occur. It's really just the species that differ. First, you'll get the wildflowers and you know weeds like this and ferns. Then you get the grasses because the grasses have generally established large root systems that survive under the soils and under the fire. Following that is what are known as the pioneer trees. Somewhere like this, that would be alders and poplars, and they will grow up and form a canopy. And over time, what happens is those trees lose their leaves, some of the pine trees start losing their needles, and of course, that creates rich soils. And then the stronger and sturdier trees grow up. And so over a number of decades, you return to that really diverse ecosystem. And in Nova Scotia, if it's left to regenerate naturally, you would end up with pretty much an Acadian forest. While in many places the forest will regenerate, in areas of intense burn, the damage can be so severe that erosion might result, and much of the nutrient soil is then washed away. This can leave open, barren land, and for it to regenerate can take significantly more time or human intervention to protect the ground and even plant seedlings. The fire here in Upper Tantalan covered about 950 hectares, and it was a very fast moving fire because of the wind. And because of that, in a lot of cases, it's really just the outside of the trees that were scorched. And that's created an interesting opportunity. Loggers have come in and they are actually taking the timber and it's being taken to a number of mills, but in particular, Freeman's Mill in Greenfield, Nova Scotia, and they're using artificial intelligence to determine what might be salvageable. And they are cutting that timber to create planks and lumber that you will be able to get at the hardware store. Poet Robert Browning once wrote, my sun sets to rise again. And certainly that happened in Spryfield after the wildfires there. And the process is already beginning here in Upper Tantalan. Now the sadness and emotional impact of the fires across Nova Scotia will certainly last long beyond the time of the visible scars on the landscape. For those whom these trails beckon on a walkabout in the years to come, may they celebrate the rising sun and the return of nature, but also never forget the devastating impact on so many families.